A brain-computer interface BCI, sometimes called a neural control interface NCI, mind-machine interface MMI, direct neural interface DNI, or brain-machine interface BMI, is a direct communication pathway between an enhanced or wired brain and an external device. BCI differs from neuromodulation in that it allows for bidirectional information flow. BCIs are often directed at researching, mapping, assisting, augmenting, or repairing human cognitive or sensory motor functions. Research on BCIs began in the 1970s at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, under a grant from the National Science Foundation, followed by a contract from DARPA. The papers published after this research also mark the first appearance of the expression brain-computer interface in scientific literature. The field of BCI research and development has since focused primarily on neuroprosthetics applications that aim at restoring damaged hearing, sight and movement. Thanks to the remarkable cortical plasticity of the brain, signals from implanted prostheses can, after adaptation, be handled by the brain like natural sensor or effector channels. Following years of animal experimentation, the first neuroprosthetic devices implanted in humans appeared in the mid-1990s. History. The history of brain-computer interfaces BCIs starts with Hans Berger's discovery of the electrical activity of the human brain and the development of electroencephalography In 1924 Berger was the first to record human brain activity by means of EEG. Berger was able to identify oscillatory activity, such as Berger's wave or the alpha wave 8 to 13 Hz, by analyzing EEG traces. Berger's first recording device was very rudimentary. He inserted silver wires under the scalps of his patients. These were later replaced by silver foils attached to the patient's head by rubber bandages. Berger connected these sensors to a Lippmann capillary electrometer, with disappointing results. However, more sophisticated measuring devices, such as the Siemens double-coil recording galvanometer, which displayed electric voltages as small as one ten-thousandth of a volt, led to success. Berger analyzed the interrelation of alternations in his EEG wave diagrams with brain diseases. EEGs permitted completely new possibilities for the research of human brain activities. Although the term had not yet been coined, one of the earliest examples of a working brain machine interface was the piece music for solo performer 1965 by the American composer Alvin Lucia. The piece makes use of EEG and analog signal processing hardware, filters, amplifiers, and a mixing board to stimulate acoustic percussion instruments. To perform the piece, one must produce alpha waves and thereby play the various percussion instruments via loudspeakers which are placed near or directly on the instruments themselves, UCLA professor Jacques Vidal coined the term BCI and produced the first peer-reviewed publications on this topic. Vidal is widely recognized as the inventor of BCIs in the BCI community, as reflected in numerous peer-reviewed articles reviewing and discussing the field e.g. His 1973 paper stated the BCI challenge control of objects using EEG signals. Especially he pointed out to contingent negative variation CNV potential as a challenge for BCI control. The 1977 experiment Vidal described was the first application of BCI after his 1973 BCI challenge. It was a non-invasive EEG actually visual evoked potentials VEP control of a cursor-like graphical object on a computer screen. The demonstration was movement in a maze. After his early contributions, Vidal was not active in BCI research, nor BCI events such as conferences, for many years. 
In 2011, however, he gave a lecture in Graz, Austria, supported by the Future BNCI project, presenting the first BCI, which earned a standing ovation. Vidal was joined by his wife, Laris Vidal, who previously worked with him at UCLA on his first BCI project. In 1988 a report was given on non-invasive EEG control of a physical object, a robot. The experiment described was EEG control of multiple start-stop restart of the robot movement, along an arbitrary trajectory defined by a line drawn on a floor. The line following behavior was the default robot behavior, utilizing autonomous intelligence and autonomous source of energy. In 1990, a report was given on a bidirectional adaptive BCI controlling computer buzzer by an anticipatory brain potential, the contingent negative variation (CNV) potential. The experiment described how an expectation state of the brain, manifested by CNV, controls in a feedback loop the S2 buzzer in the S1-S2 CNV paradigm. The obtained cognitive wave representing the expectation learning in the brain is named electroexpectogram The CNV brain potential was part of the BCI challenge presented by Vidal in his 1973 paper. Topic versus neuroprosthetics. Neuroprosthetics is an area of neuroscience concerned with neural prostheses, that is, using artificial devices to replace the function of impaired nervous systems and brain-related problems, or of sensory organs. The most widely used neuroprosthetic device is the cochlear implant which, as of December 2010, had been implanted in approximately 220,000 people worldwide. There are also several neuroprosthetic devices that aim to restore vision, including retinal implants. The difference between BCIs and neuroprosthetics is mostly in how the terms are used. Neuroprosthetics typically connect the nervous system to a device, whereas BCIs usually connect the brain or nervous system with a computer system. Practical neuroprosthetics can be linked to any part of the nervous system, for example, peripheral nerves, while the term BCI usually designates a narrower class of systems which interface with the central nervous system. The terms are sometimes, however, used interchangeably. Neuroprosthetics and BCIs seek to achieve the same aims, such as restoring sight, hearing, movement, ability to communicate, and even cognitive function. Both use similar experimental methods and surgical techniques. Animal BCI research Several laboratories have managed to record signals from monkey and rat cerebral cortices to operate BCIs to produce movement. Monkeys have navigated computer cursors on screen and commanded robotic arms to perform simple tasks simply by thinking about the task and seeing the visual feedback, but without any motor output. In May 2008 photographs that showed a monkey at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center operating a robotic arm by thinking were published in a number of well-known science journals and magazines. <laughs> Early work In 1969 the operant conditioning studies of FETS and colleagues, at the Regional Primate Research Center and Department of Physiology and Biophysics, University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle, showed for the first time that monkeys could learn to control the deflection of a biofeedback meter arm with neural activity. Similar work in the 1970s established that monkeys could quickly learn to voluntarily control the firing rates of individual and multiple neurons in the primary motor cortex if they were rewarded for generating appropriate patterns of neural activity. Studies that developed algorithms to reconstruct movements from motor cortex neurons, which control movement, date back to the 1970s. 
In the 1980s, Apostolos Georgopoulos at Johns Hopkins University found a mathematical relationship between the electrical responses of single motor cortex neurons in rhesus macaque monkeys and the direction in which they moved their arms based on a cosine function. He also found that dispersed groups of neurons, in different areas of the monkey's brains, collectively controlled motor commands, but was able to record the firings of neurons in only one area at a time. Because of the technical limitations imposed by his equipment, there has been rapid development in BCIs since the mid 1990s. Several groups have been able to capture complex brain motor cortex signals by recording from neural ensembles groups of neurons and using these to control external devices. <laughs> <laughs> Prominent research successes <laughs> Kennedy and Yang Dan Philip Kennedy, who later founded Neural Signals in 1987, and colleagues built the first intracortical brain computer interface by implanting neurotrophic cone electrodes into monkeys. In 1999, researchers led by Yang Dan at the University of California, Berkeley decoded neuronal firings to reproduce images seen by cats. The team used an array of electrodes embedded in the thalamus which integrates all of the brain's sensory input of sharp-eyed cats. Researchers targeted 177 brain cells in the thalamus lateral geniculate nucleus area, which decodes signals from the retina. The cats were shown eight short movies, and their neuron firings were recorded. Using mathematical filters, the researchers decoded the signals to generate movies of what the cats saw and were able to reconstruct recognizable scenes and moving objects. Similar results in humans have since been achieved by researchers in Japan see below. Nicolilis <inaudible> <inaudible> Miguel Nicolilis, a professor at Duke University, in Durham, North Carolina, has been a prominent proponent of using multiple electrodes spread over a greater area of the brain to obtain neuronal signals to drive a BCI. After conducting initial studies in rats during the 1990s, Nicolilis and his colleagues developed BCIs that decoded brain activity in owl monkeys and used the devices to reproduce monkey movements in robotic arms. Monkeys have advanced reaching and grasping abilities and good hand manipulation skills, making them ideal test subjects for this kind of work. By 2000 the group succeeded in building a BCI that reproduced owl monkey movements while the monkey operated a joystick or reached for food. The BCI operated in real time and could also control a separate robot remotely over Internet protocol but the monkeys could not see the arm moving and did not receive any feedback, a so-called open-loop BCI. Later experiments by Nicolilis using rhesus monkeys succeeded in closing the feedback loop and reproduced monkey reaching and grasping movements in a robot arm. With their deeply cleft and furrowed brains, rhesus monkeys are considered to be better models for human neurophysiology than owl monkeys. The monkeys were trained to reach and grasp objects on a computer screen by manipulating a joystick while corresponding movements by a robot arm were hidden. The monkeys were later shown the robot directly and learned to control it by viewing its movements. The BCI used velocity predictions to control reaching movements and simultaneously predicted hand gripping force. In 2011 O'Doherty and colleagues showed a BCI with sensory feedback with rhesus monkeys. The monkey was brain controlling the position of an avatar arm while receiving sensory feedback through direct intracortical stimulation in the arm representation area of the sensory cortex. <laughs> Donahue, Schwartz and Anderson 
Other laboratories which have developed BCIs and algorithms that decode neuron signals include those run by John Donahue at Brown University, Andrew Schwartz at the University of Pittsburgh and Richard Anderson at Caltech. These researchers have been able to produce working BCIs, even using recorded signals from far fewer neurons than did Nicolilus 15 to 30 neurons versus 50 to 200 neurons. Donahue's group reported training rhesus monkeys to use a BCI to track visual targets on a computer screen closed -loop BCI with or without assistance of a joystick. Schwartz's group created a BCI for three-dimensional tracking in virtual reality and also reproduced BCI control in a robotic arm. The same group also created headlines when they demonstrated that a monkey could feed itself pieces of fruit and marshmallows using a robotic arm controlled by the animal's own brain signals. Anderson's group used recordings of pre movement activity from the posterior parietal cortex in their BCI, including signals created when experimental animals anticipated receiving a reward. Other research In addition to predicting kinematic and kinetic parameters of limb movements, BCIs that predict electromyographic or electrical activity of the muscles of primates are being developed. Such BCIs could be used to restore mobility in paralyzed limbs by electrically stimulating muscles. Miguel Nicolilis and colleagues demonstrated that the activity of large neural ensembles can predict arm position. This work made possible creation of BCIs that read arm movement intentions and translate them into movements of artificial actuators. Carmina and colleagues programmed the neural coding in a BCI that allowed a monkey to control reaching and grasping movements by a robotic arm. Lebediv and colleagues argued that brain networks reorganized to create a new representation of the robotic appendage in addition to the representation of the animal's own limbs. The biggest impediment to BCI technology at present is the lack of a sensor modality that provides safe, accurate and robust access to brain signals. It is conceivable or even likely, however, that such a sensor will be developed within the next 20 years. The use of such a sensor should greatly expand the range of communication functions that can be provided using a BCI. Development and implementation of a BCI system is complex and time-consuming. In response to this problem, Gerwin Schalk has been developing a general-purpose system for BCI research, called BCI 2000. BCI 2000 has been in development since 2000 in a project led by the Brain Computer Interface R&D program at the Wadsworth Center of the New York State Department of Health in Albany, New York, United States. A new wireless approach uses light-gated ion channels such as channel rhodopsin to control the activity of genetically defined subsets of neurons in vivo. In the context of a simple learning task, illumination of transfected cells in the somatosensory cortex influence the decision-making process of freely moving mice. The use of BMIs has also led to a deeper understanding of neural networks and the central nervous system. Research has shown that despite the inclination of neuroscientists to believe that neurons have the most effect when working together, single neurons can be conditioned through the use of BMIs to fire at a pattern that allows primates to control motor outputs. The use of BMIs has led to development of the single neuron insufficiency principle which states that even with a well-tuned firing rate single neurons can only carry a narrow amount of information and therefore the highest level of accuracy is achieved by recording firings of the collective ensemble. Other principles discovered with the use of BMIs include the neuronal multitasking principle, the neuronal mass principle, the neural degeneracy principle, and the plasticity principle. BCIs are also proposed to be applied by users without disabilities. A user centered categorization of BCI approaches by Torsten O. Zander and Christian Kurter introduces the term passive BCI. Next to active and reactive BCI that are used for directed control, passive BCIs allow for assessing and interpreting changes in the user state during human-computer interaction HCI. 
In a secondary, implicit control loop the computer system adapts to its user improving its usability in general. The BCI Award The annual BCI Research Award is awarded in recognition of outstanding and innovative research in the field of brain-computer interfaces. Each year, a renowned research laboratory is asked to judge the submitted projects. The jury consists of world-leading BCI experts recruited by the awarding laboratory. The jury selects 12 nominees, then chooses a first, second, and third place winner, who receive awards of $3,000, $2,000, and $1,000, respectively. The following list presents the first place winners of the annual BCI Research Award 2010, Kun Tai Guan, Kai Keng Ang, Karen Sui Geok Chua and Beng Tiang, are asterisk star, Singapore Motor Imagery Based Brain Computer Interface Robotic Rehabilitation for Stroke.2011, Moritz Gross Wentrup and Bernard Skolkoff, Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems, Germany What are the neurophysiological causes of performance variations in brain computer interfacing? 2012, Sergio R. Soakadar and Neil Burbaumer, Applied Neurotechnology Lab, University Hospital Tübingen and Institute of Medical Psychology and Behavioral Neurobiology, Eberhard Karls University, Tübingen, Germany Improving Efficacy of Ipsilesional Brain Computer Interface Training in Neurorehabilitation of Chronic Stroke 2013, M. C. Dardalata, B. J. E. O. Dohitia, P. N. Sabessa, B. A Department of Physiology, Center for Integrative Neuroscience, San Francisco Francisco, California, U.S., Book Berkeley UCSF Bioengineering Graduate Program, University of California, San Francisco, California, U.S., a learning-based approach to artificial sensory feedback, intracortical microstimulation replaces and augments vision 2014, Katsuhiko Hamada, Hiromu Mori, Hiroyuki Shinoda, Thomas M. Rutkowski, the University of Tokyo, J.P., Life Science Center of Tara, University of Tsukuba, JP, RIKEN Brain Science Institute, JP Airborne Ultrasonic Tactile Display BCI 2015, Guy Hotson, David P. McMullen, Matthew S. Pfeiffer, Matthew S. Johannes, Kapil D. Katyal, Matthew P. Para, Robert Armager, William S. Anderson, Nitish V. Thakur, Brock A. Wester, Nathan E. Crone, Johns Hopkins University, USA Individual Finger Control of the Modular Prosthetic Limb Using High Density Electrocorticography in a Human Subject 2016, Gaurav Sharma, Nick Anetta, Dave Friedenberg, Marcy Bockbrader, Amar Shaykuni, W. Mysu, Chad Bouton, Ali Razai Batal Memorial Institute, The Ohio State University, USA An implanted BCI for real-time cortical control of functional wrist and finger movements in a human with quadriplegia 2017, S. Alec Berry Hussainabadi, E. N. Kamavuako, N. G. Yang, D. Farina, N. M. Rayshonch Kirsting, Center for Sensory Motor Interaction, Department of Health Science and Technology, Aalborg University, Aalborg, Denmark, Department of Systems Design Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, University of Waterloo, Waterloo, Canada, and Imperial College London, London, UK, Online Adaptive Brain Computer Interface with Attention Variations. Topic. Human BCI research Topic. Invasive BCIs Invasive BCI requires surgery to implant electrodes under scalp for communicating brain signals. The main advantage is to provide more accurate reading, however, its downside includes side effects from the surgery. After the surgery, scar tissues may form which can make brain signals weaker. In addition, according to the research of Abdul Qadir et al., 2015, once implanted electrodes, the body may not accept the electrodes which may cause medical complications. Topic. Vision 
Invasive BCI research has targeted repairing damaged sight and providing new functionality for people with paralysis. Invasive BCIs are implanted directly into the gray matter of the brain during neurosurgery. Because they lie in the gray matter, invasive devices produce the highest quality signals of BCI devices but are prone to scar tissue buildup, causing the signal to become weaker, or even non existent, as the body reacts to a foreign object in the brain. In vision science, direct brain implants have been used to treat non congenital blindness. One of the first scientists to produce a working brain interface to restore sight was private researcher William Dobell. Dobell's first prototype was implanted into Jerry, a man blinded in adulthood, in 1978. A single array BCI containing 68 electrodes was implanted onto Jerry's visual cortex and succeeded in producing phosphines, the sensation of seeing light. The system included cameras mounted on glasses to send signals to the implant. Initially, the implant allowed Jerry to see shades of gray in a limited field of vision at a low frame rate. This also required him to be hooked up to a mainframe computer, but shrinking electronics and faster computers made his artificial eye more portable and now enable him to perform simple tasks unassisted. In 2002, Jens Naumann, also blinded in adulthood, became the first in a series of 16 paying patients to receive Doble's second-generation implant, marking one of the earliest commercial uses of BCIs. The second-generation device used a more sophisticated implant enabling better mapping of phosphines into coherent vision. Phosphines are spread out across the visual field in what researchers call the starry night effect. Immediately after his implant, Jens was able to use his imperfectly restored vision to drive an automobile slowly around the parking area of the research institute. Unfortunately, Dobell died in 2004 before his processes and developments were documented. Subsequently, when Mr. Nauman and the other patients in the program began having problems with their vision, there was no relief and they eventually lost their sight again. Nauman wrote about his experience with Doble's work in Search for Paradise, a patient's account of the artificial vision experiment and has returned to his farm in southeast Ontario, Canada, to resume his normal activities. Topic. Movement BCIs focusing on motor neuroprosthetics aim to either restore movement in individuals with paralysis or provide devices to assist them, such as interfaces with computers or robot arms. Researchers at Emory University in Atlanta, led by Philip Kennedy and Roy Bakai, were first to install a brain implant in a human that produced signals of high enough quality to simulate movement. Their patient, Johnny Ray (1944–2002), suffered from locked-in syndrome after suffering a brain stem stroke in 1997. Ray's implant was installed in 1998 and he lived long enough to start working with the implant, eventually learning to control a computer cursor. He died in 2002 of a brain aneurysm. Tetraplegic Matt Nagel became the first person to control an artificial hand using a BCI in 2005 as part of the first nine month human trial of Cyberkinetics Brain Gate Chip Implant. Implanted in Nagel's right precentral gyrus area of the motor cortex for arm movement, the 96-electrode brain gate implant allowed Nagel to control a robotic arm by thinking about moving his hand as well as a computer cursor, lights and TV. One year later, Professor Jonathan Wolpore received the prize of the Altron Foundation for Innovation to develop a brain-computer interface with electrodes located on the surface of the skull, instead of directly in the brain. More recently, research teams led by the BrainGate Group at Brown University and a group led by University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, both in collaborations with the United States Department of Veterans Affairs, have demonstrated further success in direct control of robotic prosthetic limbs with many degrees of freedom using direct connections to arrays of neurons in the motor cortex of patients with tetraplegia.
Topic: <laughs> Partially invasive BCIs. Partially invasive BCI devices are implanted inside the skull but rest outside the brain rather than within the gray matter. They produce better resolution signals than non-invasive BCIs where the bone tissue of the cranium deflects and deforms signals and have a lower risk of forming scar tissue in the brain than fully invasive BCIs. There has been preclinical demonstration of intracortical BCIs from the stroke perilesional cortex. Electrocorticography (ECOG) measures the electrical activity of the brain taken from beneath the skull in a similar way to non-invasive electroencephalography, but the electrodes are embedded in a thin plastic pad that is placed above the cortex beneath the dura mater. ECOG technologies were first trialed in humans in 2004 by Eric Luthart and Daniel Moran from Washington University in St. Louis. In a later trial, the researchers enabled a teenage boy to play Space Invaders using his ECOG implant. This research indicates that control is rapid, requires minimal training, and may be an ideal trade off with regards to signal fidelity and level of invasiveness. Note, these electrodes had not been implanted in the patient with the intention of developing a BCI. The patient had been suffering from severe epilepsy and the electrodes were temporarily implanted to help his physicians localize seizure foci. The BCI researchers simply took advantage of this. Signals can be either subdural or epidural, but are not taken from within the brain parenchyma itself. It has not been studied extensively until recently due to the limited access of subjects. Currently, the only manner to acquire the signal for study is through the use of patients requiring invasive monitoring for localization and resection of an epileptogenic focus. ECOG is a very promising intermediate BCI modality because it has higher spatial resolution, better signal-to-noise ratio, wider frequency range, and less training requirements than scalp-recorded EEG, and at the same time has lower technical difficulty, lower clinical risk, and probably superior long-term stability than intracortical single neuron recording. This feature profile and recent evidence of the high level of control with minimal training requirements shows potential for real world application for people with motor disabilities. Light reactive imaging BCI devices are still in the realm of theory. These would involve implanting a laser inside the skull. The laser would be trained on a single neuron and the neuron's reflectance measured by a separate sensor. When the neuron fires, the laser light pattern and wavelengths it reflects would change slightly. This would allow researchers to monitor single neurons but require less contact with tissue and reduce the risk of scar tissue buildup. <laughs> Non-invasive BCIs There have also been experiments in humans using non-invasive neuroimaging technologies as interfaces. The substantial majority of published BCI work involves non-invasive EEG-based BCIs. Non-invasive EEG-based technologies and interfaces have been used for a much broader variety of applications. Although EEG-based interfaces are easy to wear and do not require surgery, they have relatively poor spatial resolution and cannot effectively use higher frequency signals because the skull dampens signals, dispersing and blurring the electromagnetic waves created by the neurons. EEG-based interfaces also require some time and effort prior to each usage session, whereas non-EEG-based ones, as well as invasive ones require no prior usage training. Overall, the best BCI for each user depends on numerous factors. <laughs> Non-EEG-based human-computer interface Topic. Pupil size oscillation 
In a 2016 article, an entirely new communication device and non-EEG-based human computer interface was developed, requiring no visual fixation or ability to move eyes at all, that is based on covert interest in i.e. without fixing eyes on chosen letter on a virtual keyboard with letters each having its own background circle that is micro-oscillating in brightness in different time transitions, where the letter selection is based on best fit between, on one hand, un intentional pupil size oscillation pattern, and, on the other hand, the circle in background's brightness oscillation pattern. Accuracy is additionally improved by users' mental rehearsing the words bright and dark in synchrony with the brightness transitions of the circle, letter. Functional near-infrared spectroscopy in 2014 and 2017, a BCI using functional near-infrared spectroscopy for locked-in patients with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis ALS was able to restore some basic ability of the patients to communicate with other people. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Electroencephalography (EEG) based brain-computer interfaces. Topic Overview Electroencephalography EEG is the most studied non-invasive interface, mainly due to its fine temporal resolution, ease of use, portability and low setup cost. The technology is somewhat susceptible to noise however. In the early days of BCI research, another substantial barrier to using EEG as a brain-computer interface was the extensive training required before users can work the technology. For example, in experiments beginning in the mid-1990s, Niels Berbaumer at the University of Tübingen in Germany trained severely paralyzed people to self-regulate the slow cortical potentials in their EEG to such an extent that these signals could be used as a binary signal to control a computer cursor. Berbaumer had earlier trained epileptics to prevent impending fits by controlling this low voltage wave. The experiment saw 10 patients trained to move a computer cursor by controlling their brainwaves. The process was slow, requiring more than an hour for patients to write 100 characters with the cursor, while training often took many months. However, the slow cortical potential approach to BCIs has not been used in several years, since other approaches require little or no training, are faster and more accurate, and work for a greater proportion of users. Another research parameter is the type of oscillatory activity that is measured. Burbaumer's later research with Jonathan Wolpore at New York State University has focused on developing technology that would allow users to choose the brain signals they found easiest to operate a BCI, including mu and beta rhythms. A further parameter is the method of feedback used and this is shown in studies of P300 signals. Patterns of P300 waves are generated involuntarily stimulus feedback when people see something they recognize and may allow BCIs to decode categories of thoughts without training patients first. By contrast, the biofeedback methods described above require learning to control brain waves so the resulting brain activity can be detected. While an EEG-based brain-computer interface has been pursued extensively by a number of research labs, recent advancements made by Bin He and his team at the University of Minnesota suggest the potential of an EEG-based brain-computer interface to accomplish tasks close to invasive brain-computer interface. Using advanced functional neuroimaging including bold functional MRI and EEG source imaging, Bin He and co-workers identified the co-variation and co-localization of electrophysiological and hemodynamic signals induced by motor imagination. Refined by a neuroimaging approach and by a training protocol, Bin He and co-workers demonstrated the ability of a non-invasive EEG-based brain-computer interface to control the flight of a virtual helicopter in three-dimensional space, based upon motor imagination. 
In June 2013 it was announced that Binhi had developed the technique to enable a remote control helicopter to be guided through an obstacle course, in addition to a brain-computer interface based on brain waves, as recorded from scalp EEG electrodes, Binhi and co-workers explored a virtual EEG signal-based brain-computer interface by first solving the EEG inverse problem and then used the resulting virtual EEG for brain-computer interface tasks. Well-controlled studies suggested the merits of such a source analysis-based brain-computer interface. A 2014 study found that severely motor-impaired patients could communicate faster and more reliably with non-invasive EEG BCI than with any muscle-based communication channel. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Dry active electrode arrays. In the early 1990s Babak Tahiri, at University of California, Davis demonstrated the first single and also multi-channel dry active electrode arrays using micro-machining. The single-channel dry EEG electrode construction and results were published in 1994. The arrayed electrode was also demonstrated to perform well compared to silver, silver chloride electrodes. The device consisted of four sites of sensors with integrated electronics to reduce noise by impedance matching. The advantages of such electrodes are, 1 no electrolyte used, 2 no skin preparation, 3 significantly reduced sensor size, and 4 compatibility with EEG monitoring systems. The active electrode array is an integrated system made of an array of capacitive sensors with local integrated circuitry housed in a package with batteries to power the circuitry. This level of integration was required to achieve the functional performance obtained by the electrode. The electrode was tested on an electrical test bench and on human subjects in four modalities of EEG activity, namely, 1 spontaneous EEG, 2 sensory event-related potentials, 3 brain stem potentials, and 4 cognitive event-related potentials. The performance of the dry electrode compared favorably with that of the standard wet electrodes in terms of skin preparation, no gel requirements, dry, and higher signal to noise ratio. In 1999, researchers at Case Western Reserve University, in Cleveland, Ohio, led by Hunter Peckham, used 64 electrode EEG skullcap to return limited hand movements to quadriplegic Jim Jatic. As Jatic concentrated on simple but opposite concepts like up and down, his beta rhythm EEG output was analyzed using software to identify patterns in the noise. A basic pattern was identified and used to control a switch, above average activity was set to on, below average off. As well as enabling Jatic to control a computer cursor the signals were also used to drive the nerve controllers embedded in his hands, restoring some movement. SSVEP mobile EEG BCIs In 2009, the NCTU Brain Computer Interface headband was reported. The researchers who developed this BCI headband also engineered silicon-based microelectromechanical system MEMS dry electrodes designed for application in non-hairy sites of the body. These electrodes were secured to the DAQ board in the headband with snap-on electrode holders. The signal processing module measured alpha activity and the Bluetooth-enabled phone assessed the patient's alertness and capacity for cognitive performance. When the subject became drowsy, the phone sent a rousing feedback to the operator to rouse them. This research was supported by the National Science Council, Taiwan, ROC, NSC, National Chiao Tung University, Taiwan's Ministry of Education, and the U.S. Army Research Laboratory. In 2011, researchers reported a cellular based BCI with the capability of taking EEG data and converting it into a command to cause the phone to ring. This research was supported in part by Abraxas Bioscience LLP, the U.S. Army Research Laboratory, and the Army Research Office. 
The developed technology was a wearable system composed of a four-channel biosignal acquisition, amplification module, a wireless transmission module, and a Bluetooth-enabled cell phone. The electrodes were placed so that they pick up steady-state visual evoked potentials SSVEPs. SSVEPs are electrical responses to flickering visual stimuli with repetition rates over 6 Hz that are best found in the parietal and occipital scalp regions of the visual cortex. It was reported that with this BCI setup, all study participants were able to initiate the phone call with minimal practice in natural environments. The scientists claim that their studies using a single channel fast Fourier transform FFT and multiple channel system canonical correlation analysis CCA algorithm support the capacity of mobile BCIs. The CCA algorithm has been applied in other experiments investigating BCIs with claimed high performance in accuracy as well as speed. While the cellular-based BCI technology was developed to initiate a phone call from SSVEPs, the researchers said that it can be translated for other applications, such as picking up sensory motor mu, beta rhythms to function as a motor imagery based BCI. In 2013, comparative tests were performed on Android cell phone, tablet, and computer-based BCIs, analyzing the power spectrum density of resultant EEG SSVEPs. The stated goals of this study, which involved scientists supported in part by the U.S. Army Research Laboratory, were to increase the practicability, portability, and ubiquity of an SSVEP-based BCI. For daily use, citation it was reported that the stimulation frequency on all mediums was accurate, although the cell phone's signal demonstrated some instability. The amplitudes of the SSVEPs for the laptop and tablet were also reported to be larger than those of the cell phone. These two qualitative characterizations were suggested as indicators of the feasibility of using a mobile stimulus BCI. <laughs> Limitations in 2011, researchers stated that continued work should address ease of use, performance robustness, reducing hardware and software costs. One of the difficulties with EEG readings is the large susceptibility to motion artifacts. In most the previously described research projects, the participants were asked to sit still, reducing head and eye movements as much as possible, and measurements were taken in a laboratory setting. However, since the emphasized application of these initiatives had been in creating a mobile device for daily use, the technology had to be tested in motion. In 2013, researchers tested mobile EEG-based BCI technology, measuring SSVEPs from participants as they walked on a treadmill at varying speeds. This research was supported by the Office of Naval Research, Army Research Office, and the U.S. Army Research Laboratory. Stated results were that as speed increased the SSVEP detectability using CCA decreased. As independent component analysis had been shown to be efficient in separating EEG signals from noise, the scientists applied ECA to CCA extracted EEG data. They stated that the CCA data with and without ECA processing were similar. Thus, they concluded that CCA independently demonstrated a robustness to motion artifacts that indicates it may be a beneficial algorithm to apply to BCIs used in real-world conditions. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Prosthesis and environment control. Non-invasive BCIs have also been applied to enable brain control of prosthetic upper and lower extremity devices in people with paralysis. For example, Gert Furchler of Graz University of Technology and colleagues demonstrated a BCI-controlled functional electrical stimulation system to restore upper extremity movements in a person with tetraplegia due to spinal cord injury. 
Between 2012 and 2013, researchers at the University of California, Irvine demonstrated for the first time that it is possible to use BCI technology to restore brain-controlled walking after spinal cord injury. In their spinal cord injury research study, a person with paraplegia was able to operate a BCI robotic gait orthosis to regain basic brain-controlled ambulation. In 2009 Alex Blaney, an independent researcher based in the UK, successfully used the emotive EPOC to control a five-axis robot arm. He then went on to make several demonstration mind-controlled wheelchairs and home automation that could be operated by people with limited or no motor control such as those with paraplegia and cerebral palsy. Research into military use of BCIs funded by DARPA has been ongoing since the 1970s. The current focus of research is user-to-user -user communication through analysis of neural signals. <laughs> DIY and open source BCI In 2001, the OpenEEC project was initiated by a group of DIY neuroscientists and engineers. The modular EEC was the primary device created by the OpenEEC community. It was a six channel signal capture board that cost between $200 and $400 to make at home. The OpenEEC project marked a significant moment in the emergence of DIY brain computer interfacing. In 2010, the Frontier Nerds of NYU's ITP program published a thorough tutorial titled How to Hack Toy EEGs. The tutorial, which stirred the minds of many budding DIY BCI enthusiasts, demonstrated how to create a single-channel at-home EEG with an Arduino and a Mattel Minflex at a very reasonable price. This tutorial amplified the DIY BCI movement. In 2013, OpenBCI emerged from a DARPA solicitation and subsequent Kickstarter campaign. They created a high-quality, open-source 8-channel EEG acquisition board, known as the 32-bit board, that retailed for under $500. Two years later they created the first 3D printed EEG headset, known as the Ultracortex, as well as a four-channel EEG acquisition board, known as the Ganglion board, that retailed for under $100. <laughs> <laughs> MEG and MRI Magnetoencephalography and functional magnetic resonance imaging have both been used successfully as non-invasive BCIs. In a widely reported experiment, fMRI allowed two users being scanned to play Pong in real time by altering their hemodynamic response or brain blood flow through biofeedback techniques. fMRI measurements of hemodynamic responses in real time have also been used to control robot arms with a seven second delay between thought and movement. In 2008, research developed in the Advanced Telecommunications Research Computational Neuroscience Laboratory in Kyoto, Japan, allowed the scientists to reconstruct images directly from the brain and display them on a computer in black and white at a resolution of 10 by 10 pixels. The article announcing these achievements was the cover story of the journal Neuron of the 10th of December 2008. In 2011, researchers from UC Berkeley published a study reporting second-by-second -second reconstruction of videos watched by the study's subjects from fMRI data. This was achieved by creating a statistical model relating visual patterns in videos shown to the subjects, to the brain activity caused by watching the videos. This model was then used to look up the 101 second video segments, in a database of 18 million seconds of random YouTube videos, whose visual patterns most closely matched the brain activity recorded when subjects watched a new video. These 101 second video extracts were then combined into a mashed up image that resembled the video being watched. Topic: <laughs> BCI control strategies in neurogaming. Topic: <laughs> 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 
Topic: Motor imagery. Motor imagery involves the imagination of the movement of various body parts resulting in sensory motor cortex activation, which modulates sensory motor oscillations in the EEG. This can be detected by the BCI to infer a user's intent. Motor imagery typically requires a number of sessions of training before acceptable control of the BCI is acquired. These training sessions may take a number of hours over several days before users can consistently employ the technique with acceptable levels of precision. Regardless of the duration of the training session, users are unable to master the control scheme. This results in very slow pace of the gameplay. Advanced machine learning methods were recently developed to compute a subject-specific model for detecting the performance of motor imagery. The top performing algorithm from BCI Competition IV Dataset 2 for motor imagery is the Filter Bank Common Spatial Pattern, developed by Ang A. Al, from A. Asterisk Star, Singapore. <laughs> Bio – Neurofeedback for Passive BCI Designs Biofeedback is used to monitor a subject's mental relaxation. In some cases, biofeedback does not monitor electroencephalography (EEG), but instead bodily parameters such as electromyography (EMG), galvanic skin resistance (GSR), and heart rate variability (HRV). Many biofeedback systems are used to treat certain disorders such as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder ADHD, sleep problems in children, teeth grinding, and chronic pain. EEG biofeedback systems typically monitor four different bands theta, 4 to 7 Hz, alpha, 8 to 12 Hz, SMR, 12 to 15 Hz, beta, 15 to 18 Hz and challenge the subject to control them. Passive BCI involves using BCI to enrich human-machine interaction with implicit information on the actual user's state, for example, simulations to detect when users intend to push brakes during an emergency car stopping procedure. Game developers using passive BCIs need to acknowledge that through repetition of game levels the user's cognitive state will change or adapt. Within the first play, of a level, the user will react to things differently from during the second play, for example, the user will be less surprised at an event in the game if he, she is expecting it. Visual Evoked Potential A VEP is an electrical potential recorded after a subject is presented with a type of visual stimuli. There are several types of VEPs. Steady state visually evoked potentials SSVEPs use potentials generated by exciting the retina, using visual stimuli modulated at certain frequencies. SSVEP stimuli are often formed from alternating checkerboard patterns and at times simply use flashing images. The frequency of the phase reversal of the stimulus used can be clearly distinguished in the spectrum of an EEG, this makes detection of SSVEP stimuli relatively easy. SSVEP has proved to be successful within many BCI systems. This is due to several factors, the signal elicited is measurable in as large a population as the transient VEP and blink movement and electrocardiographic artifacts do not affect the frequencies monitored. In addition, the SSVEP signal is exceptionally robust, the topographic organization of the primary visual cortex is such that a broader area obtains afferents from the central or foveal region of the visual field. SSVEP does have several problems however. As SSVEPs use flashing stimuli to infer a user's intent, the user must gaze at one of the flashing or iterating symbols in order to interact with the system. It is, therefore, likely that the symbols could become irritating and uncomfortable to use during longer play sessions, which can often last more than an hour which may not be an ideal gameplay. Another type of VEP used with applications is the P300 potential. 
The P300 event related potential is a positive peak in the EEG that occurs at roughly 300 milliseconds after the appearance of a target stimulus, a stimulus for which the user is waiting or seeking or oddball stimuli. The P300 amplitude decreases as the target stimuli and the ignored stimuli grow more similar. The P300 is thought to be related to a higher level attention process or an orienting response using P300 as a control scheme has the advantage of the participant only having to attend limited training sessions. The first application to use the P300 model was the P300 matrix. Within this system, a subject would choose a letter from a grid of six by six letters and numbers. The rows and columns of the grid flashed sequentially and every time the selected choice letter was illuminated the user's P300 was potentially elicited. However, the communication process, at approximately 17 characters per minute, was quite slow. The P300 is a BCI that offers a discrete selection rather than a continuous control mechanism. The advantage of P300 use within games is that the player does not have to teach himself, herself how to use a completely new control system and so only has to undertake short training instances, to learn the gameplay mechanics and basic use of the BCI paradigm. Topic. Synthetic telepathy, silent communication In 2010 the DARPA's budget for the fiscal year included $4 million to start up a program called Silent Talk. The goal was to "...allow user-to-user -user communication on the battlefield without the use of vocalized speech through analysis of neural signals." The program had three major goals, one, to attempt to identify electroencephalography patterns unique to individual words, two, ensure that those patterns are generalizable across users in order to prevent extensive device training, and three, construct a fieldable pre-prototype that would decode the signal and transmit over a limited range. In a $6.3 million Army initiative to invent devices for telepathic communication, Gerwin Schalk, underwritten in a $2.2 million million dollars grant, found the use of ECOG signals can discriminate the vowels and consonants embedded in spoken and imagined words, shedding light on the distinct mechanisms associated with production of vowels and consonants, and could provide the basis for brain-based communication using imagined speech. In 2002 Kevin Warwick had an array of 100 electrodes fired into his nervous system in order to link his nervous system into the Internet to investigate enhancement possibilities. Abilities. With this in place Warwick successfully carried out a series of experiments. With electrodes also implanted into his wife's nervous system, they conducted the first direct electronic communication experiment between the nervous systems of two humans. Research into synthetic telepathy using subvocalization is taking place at the University of California, Irvine under lead scientist Mike Desmura. The first such communication took place in the 1960s using EEG to create Morse code using brain alpha waves. Using EEG to communicate imagined speech is less accurate than the invasive method of placing an electrode between the skull and the brain. On 27 February 2013 the group with Miguel Nicolilis at Duke University and IINNL successfully connected the brains of two rats with electronic interfaces that allowed them to directly share information. In the first ever direct brain-to-brain -brain interface, on 3 September 2014, direct communication between human brains became a possibility over extended distances through Internet transmission of EEG signals. In March and May 2014, a study conducted by Dipartimento di Psicologia Generale, Università di Padova, EVANLAB, Firenze, Liquidweb S, R, L, Company and Dipartimento di Ingegneria e Architettura, Università di Trieste, showed confirmatory results analyzing the EEG activity of two human partners spatially separated approximately 190 km apart when one member of the pair receives the stimulation and the second one is connected connected only mentally with the first.
Topic: <laughs> Cell culture BCIs. Researchers have built devices to interface with neural cells and entire neural networks in cultures outside animals. As well as furthering research on animal implantable devices, experiments on cultured neural tissue have focused on building problem-solving networks, constructing basic computers and manipulating robotic devices. Research into techniques for stimulating and recording from individual neurons grown on semiconductor chips is sometimes referred to as neuroelectronics or neurochips. Development of the first working neurochip was claimed by a Caltech team led by Jerome Pine and Michael Marr in 1997. The Caltech chip had room for 16 neurons. In 2003 a team led by Theodore Berger, at the University of Southern California, started work on a neurochip designed to function as an artificial or prosthetic hippocampus. The neurochip was designed to function in rat brains and was intended as a prototype for the eventual development of higher brain prosthesis. The hippocampus was chosen because it is thought to be the most ordered and structured part of the brain and is the most studied area. Its function is to encode experiences for storage as long term memories elsewhere in the brain. In 2004, Thomas DeMars at the University of Florida used a culture of 25,000 neurons taken from a rat's brain to fly a F 22 fighter jet aircraft simulator. After collection, the cortical neurons were cultured in a petri dish and rapidly began to reconnect themselves to form a living neural network. The cells were arranged over a grid of 60 electrodes and used to control the pitch and yaw functions of the simulator. The study's focus was on understanding how the human brain performs and learns computational tasks at a cellular level. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Ethical considerations. Important ethical, legal and societal issues related to brain-computer interfacing are Conceptual issues researchers disagree over what is and what is not a brain-computer interface Obtaining informed consent from people who have difficulty communicating Risk-benefit analysis Shared responsibility of BCI teams e.g. how to ensure that responsible group decisions can be made the consequences of BCI technology for the quality of life of patients and their families Side effects e.g. neurofeedback of sensory motor rhythm training is reported to affect sleep quality Personal responsibility and its possible constraints e.g. who is responsible for erroneous actions with a neuroprosthesis Issues concerning personality and personhood and its possible alteration Blurring of the division between human and machine Therapeutic applications and their possible exceedance Questions of research ethics that arise when progressing from animal experimentation to application in human subjects Mind reading and privacy Mind control Use of the technology in advanced interrogation techniques by governmental authorities Selective enhancement and social stratification Communication to the media, in their current form, most BCIs are far removed from the ethical issues considered above. They are actually similar to corrective therapies in function. Clausen stated in 2009 that, BCIs pose ethical challenges, but these are conceptually similar to those that bioethicists have addressed for other realms of therapy. Moreover, he suggests that bioethics is well prepared to deal with the issues that arise with BCI technologies. Hazelaja and colleagues pointed out that expectations of BCI efficacy and value play a great role in ethical analysis and the way BCI scientists should approach media. Furthermore, standard protocols can be implemented to ensure ethically sound informed consent procedures with locked in patients. The case of BCIs today has parallels in medicine, as will its evolution. 
much as pharmaceutical science began as a balance for impairments and is now used to increase focus and reduce need for sleep, BCIs will likely transform gradually from therapies to enhancements. Researchers are well aware that sound ethical guidelines, appropriately moderated enthusiasm in media coverage and education about BCI systems will be of utmost importance for the societal acceptance of this technology. Thus, recently more effort is made inside the BCI community to create consensus on ethical guidelines for BCI research, development and dissemination. <laughs> Low-cost BCI-based interfaces Recently a number of companies have scaled back medical grade EEG technology and in one case Neuroski rebuilt the technology from the ground up to create inexpensive BCIs This technology has been built into toys and gaming devices some of these toys have been extremely commercially successful like the Neuroski and Mattel Minflex in 2006 Sony patented a neural interface system allowing radio waves to affect signals in the neural cortex. In 2007 Neuroski released the first affordable consumer-based EEG along with the game Neuroboy. This was also the first large-scale EEG device to use dry sensor technology. In 2008 OCZ Technology developed a device for use in video games relying primarily on electromyography. In 2008 the Final Fantasy developer Square Enix announced that it was partnering with Neuroski to create a game, Judeca. In 2009 Mattel partnered with Neuroski to release the Minflex, a game that used an EEG to steer a ball through an obstacle course. By far the best-selling consumer-based EEG to date. In 2009 Uncle Milton Industries partnered with Neuroski to release the Star Wars Force Trainer, a game designed to create the illusion of possessing the Force. In 2009 Emotive released the EPOC, a 14-channel EEG device that can read four mental states, 13 conscious states, facial expressions, and head movements. The EPOC is the first commercial BCI to use dry sensor technology, which can be dampened with a saline solution for a better connection. In November 2011 Time magazine selected, Nekomimi, produced by Neuroware as one of the best inventions of the year. The company announced that it expected to launch a consumer version of the garment, consisting of cat-like ears controlled by a brainwave reader produced by Neuroski, in spring 2012. In February 2014 They Shall Walk, a non-profit organization fixed on constructing exoskeletons, dubbed LIFESUITs, for paraplegics and quadriplegics, began a partnership with James W. Shikaji on the development of a wireless BCI. In 2016, a group of hobbyists developed an open-source BCI board that sends neural signals to the audio jack of a smartphone, dropping the cost of entry-level BCI to £20. Basic diagnostic software is available for Android devices, as well as a text entry app for Unity. <laughs> Future directions. A consortium consisting of 12 European partners has completed a roadmap to support the European Commission in their funding decisions for the new framework programme Horizon 2020. The project, which was funded by the European Commission, started in November 2013 and ended in April 2015. The roadmap is now complete, and can be downloaded on the project's webpage. A 2015 publication led by Dr. Clemens Brunner describes some of the analyses and achievements of this project, as well as the Emerging Brain Computer Interface Society. For example, this article reviewed work within this project that further defined BCIs and applications, explored recent trends, discussed ethical issues, and evaluated different directions for new BCIs. 
As the article notes, their new roadmap generally extends and supports the recommendations from the future BNCI project managed by Dr. Brendan Allison, which conveys substantial enthusiasm for emerging BCI directions. In addition to, other recent publications have explored the most promising future BCI directions for new groups of disabled users e.g. Some prominent examples are summarized below. Topic: <laughs> Disorders of Consciousness Doc. Some persons have a disorder of consciousness Doc. This state is defined to include persons with coma, as well as persons in a vegetative state VS or minimally conscious state MCS. New BCI research seeks to help persons with DOC in different ways. A key initial goal is to identify patients who are able to perform basic cognitive tasks, which would of course lead to a change in their diagnosis. That is, some persons who are diagnosed with DOC may in fact be able to process information and make important life decisions such as whether to seek therapy, where to live, and their views on end-of-life decisions regarding them. Some persons who are diagnosed with DOC die as a result of end-of-life decisions, which may be made by family members who sincerely feel this is in the patient's best interests. Given the new prospect of allowing these patients to provide their views on this decision, there would seem to be a strong ethical pressure to develop this research direction to guarantee that DOC patients are given an opportunity to decide whether they want to live. These and other articles describe new challenges and solutions to use BCI technology to help persons with DOC. One major challenge is that these patients cannot use BCIs based on vision. Hence, new tools rely on auditory and or vibrotactile stimuli. Patients may wear headphones and or vibrotactile stimulators placed on the wrists, neck, leg, and or other locations. Another challenge is that patients may fade in and out of consciousness, and can only communicate at certain times. This may indeed be a cause of mistaken diagnosis. Some patients may only be able to respond to physicians' requests during a few hours per day which might not be predictable ahead of time and thus may have been unresponsive during diagnosis. Therefore, new methods rely on tools that are easy to use in field settings, even without expert help, so family members and other persons without any medical or technical background can still use them. This reduces the cost, time, need for expertise, and other burdens with DOC assessment. Automated tools can ask simple questions that patients can easily answer, such as, Is your father named George? Or, Were you born in the USA? Automated instructions inform patients that they may convey yes or no by, for example, focusing their attention on stimuli on the right versus left wrist. This focused attention produces reliable changes in EEG patterns that can help determine that the patient is able to communicate. The results could be presented to physicians and therapists, which could lead to a revised diagnosis and therapy. In addition, these patients could then be provided with BCI-based communication tools that could help them convey basic needs, adjust bed position and HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, and otherwise empower them to make major life decisions and communicate. This research effort was supported in part by different EU-funded projects, such as the Decoder project led by Professor Andrea Kubler at the University of Würzburg. This project contributed to the first BCI system developed for DOC assessment and communication, called MindBeagle. This system is designed to help non-expert users work with DOC patients, but is not intended to replace medical staff. An EU-funded project that began in 2015 called Comalert conducted further research and development to improve DOC prediction, assessment, rehabilitation, and communication, called PARC. In that project, another project funded by the National Science Foundation is led by profs. Dean Kruzienski and Chang Nam. 
This project provides for improved vibrotactile systems, advanced signal analysis, and other improvements for dock assessment and communication. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Motor recovery. People may lose some of their ability to move due to many causes, such as stroke or injury. Several groups have explored systems and methods for motor recovery that include BCIs. In this approach, a BCI measures motor activity while the patient imagines or attempts movements as directed by a therapist. The BCI may provide two benefits, one, if the BCI indicates that a patient is not imagining a movement correctly non-compliance, then the BCI could inform the patient and therapist, and two, rewarding feedback such as functional stimulation or the movement of a virtual avatar also depends on the patient's correct movement imagery. So far, BCIs for motor recovery have relied on the EEG to measure the patient's motor imagery. However, studies have also used fMRI to study different changes in the brain as persons undergo BCI-based stroke rehab training. Future systems might include the fMRI and other measures for real-time control, such as functional near-infrared, probably in tandem with EEGs. Non-invasive brain stimulation has also been explored in combination with BCIs for motor recovery, like the work with BCIs for DOC. This research direction was funded by different public funding mechanisms within the EU and elsewhere. The VIA project included work on a new system for stroke rehabilitation focused on BCIs and advanced virtual environments designed to provide the patient with immersive feedback to foster recovery. This project, and the Recoverix project that focused exclusively on a new BCI system for stroke patients, contributed to a hardware and software platform called Recoverix. This system includes a BCI as well as a functional electrical stimulator and virtual feedback. In September 2016, a training facility called a Recoverix gym opened in Austria, in which therapists use this system to provide motor rehab therapy to persons with stroke. <laughs> <laughs> Functional brain mapping Each year, about 400,000 people undergo brain mapping during neurosurgery. This procedure is often required for people with tumors or epilepsy that do not respond to medication. During this procedure, electrodes are placed on the brain to precisely identify the locations of structures and functional areas. Patients may be awake during neurosurgery and asked to perform certain tasks, such as moving fingers or repeating words. This is necessary so that surgeons can remove only the desired tissue while sparing other regions, such as critical movement or language regions. Removing too much brain tissue can cause permanent damage, while removing too little tissue can leave the underlying condition untreated and require additional neurosurgery. Thus, there is a strong need to improve both methods and systems to map the brain as effectively as possible. In several recent publications, BCI research experts and medical doctors have collaborated to explore new ways to use BCI technology to improve neurosurgical mapping. This work focuses largely on high gamma activity, which is difficult to detect with non-invasive means. Results have led to improved methods for identifying key areas for movement, language, and other functions. A recent article addressed advances in functional brain mapping and summarizes a workshop. Topic: Flexible devices. Flexible electronics are polymers or other flexible materials, e.g., silk, pentacene, PDMS, paraline, polyamide, that are printed with circuitry. The flexible nature of the organic background materials allowing the electronics created to bend, and the fabrication techniques utilized to create these devices resembles those used to create integrated circuits and microelectromechanical systems. MEMS. 
Flexible electronics were first developed in the 1960s and 1970s, but research interest increased in the mid 2000s. Topic: Neural dust. Neural dust is a term used to refer to millimeter-sized devices operated as wirelessly powered nerve sensors that were proposed in a 2011 paper from the University of California, Berkeley Wireless Research Center, which described both the challenges and outstanding benefits of creating a long-lasting wireless BCI. In one proposed model of the neural dust sensor, the transistor model allowed for a method of separating between local field potentials and action potential spikes", which would allow for a greatly diversified wealth of data acquirable from the recordings. <laughs> See also <laughs>